Hello everyone, my name is Alexander Joust and I'm a researcher at the University of Stuttgart. Here I'm a member of the SFB 1313 a Collaborative Research Center that investigates interface-driven multi-field processes in Polis Media, where we focus on different fields like flow, transport, and also deformation in this Polis Media. Now I am especially interested in coupling interface coupled problems at the moment, some things like porous media and free flow, but also fracture flow and deformation porous media. So the, 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 this is like what we will talk about today. Just let, before I really want to start, let me just give you a short overview here on this left bar. I also collected some useful information for you. So you find more information about the SFB on the SFB homepage and more about my project DO2 on this homepage as well. And the content of this presentation is based on our, on our recent publication, which you can find via the DOI here. This publication also comes with a data set, so it contains all the meshes and scripts to run the simulations if you want, and a description of the mathematical model for these kind of problems you find in these two papers here at the bottom. But so with that, let's start with the actual slides, uh, with the actual presentation. Uh, let's talk about simulation of flow in deformable fractures. So we have problems, a hopefully interface coupled problem that we want to, to couple or that we want to solve. So we have a porous medium, this is like the gray box here, and inside we have fractures. And these fractures are filled with some liquid, in our case it's an incompressible fluid, so we can assume for the moment that it's water. And you already see, I will also just highlight this now, there is like a sharp interface. There's a clear separation between the fracture, so the liquid in the fracture, and the porous medium. This is very nice because this means we should be able to couple this via or interpret this as an interface coupled problem and couple this in, in the end with precise using two individual solvers. To get a bit more into this hey, physical setup, uh, look into this here, like on the right, a second example. In 3D, we have like a cube shape porous medium and inside we have a fracture. This is like this smaller brown part here. Like to make it maybe a bit more visible and also understandable what we're doing in the simulation sake, I've drawn this as a 2D image on the left. So we have this some kind of already existing fracture that potentially drill a hole through to inject water afterwards. This water we inject with very high pressure. And due to this injection with high pressure, the porous medium surrounding it, this porous medium can be a rock for example, but also something else, this will then start to deform due to the high pressure. This high pressure at the same time yeah, changes yeah. Then the, the shape of this fracture. The new shape of the fracture induces a new pressure profile among, inside the liquid of the, the fracture, which in turn creates a slightly different deformation of the of the porous medium and so on. So this is basically what you want to do. It's like a common thing you do also like in investigation uh, of the ground, for example, for uh, what it's called geothermal uh, yeah, energy, for example, or if you also want to re recover oil, but there's also more applications to that. Now, uh, one thing that I want to emphasize here for our simulations and especially our model is like here already say on the right, I will just zoom a bit into this picture, into this fracture. You see here the brown part, it's basically, yeah, it sticks here partially out to, to the, the way I, I show you this in the plot. And what you see here hopefully is that this fracture is actually a brown more like disc or a ring, but uh, <clears throat> it's actually not a three-dimensional object. Since these fractures are usually very, very thin, but rather yeah, big or rather wide, uh, we can simplify the mathematical model or the model that we used uh, uses some simplifications, uh, or is allowed to use some simplifications. So we can model that actually with a lower dimension than the actual surrounding porous medium, which is quite nice because it makes life a bit easier. But you will see also in a second, it makes it a bit more interesting or challenging to couple such problems properly. Now let's start with the general setup. Uh, so we have a porous matrix or porous medium and a solver for that, that gets this pressure on the interface. And from that we can compute the new yeah, deformation or the displacement of the fracture. 
So the displacement means then the, how the top or the bottom part of the fracture changes its shape. At the same time, we have this fracture domain, which needs, a, needs this displacement to compute a new pressure distribution inside the liquid of the fracture. So this is basically what you do. You maybe also recognize this setup a bit from the documentation or publications of Precise. So we handle our servers also as black boxes. We don't really want to know what is happening inside there. You just get some input quantity and one output quantity. And for us, it's the pressure and the displacement. And now in order to get the behavior of the actual coupled problem of the flow in the fracture and the surrounding porous medium, yeah, we have to glue them together again. And this we will do with precise to run the solvers one after the other in the yeah, suitable way with some acceleration scheme involved in there until we can recover yeah, the coupled solution in the, the common way you know from precise. Now, uh, the like one thing I want to point out, I talk here about displacement so far. Um, since we have this mixed dimensional property and the fracture flow is actually a lower dimension than the porous medium around that, we don't need the detailed displacement. So we don't really need to know how much does the top move and the bottom of the fracture move. We are actually fine just with the aperture. And the aperture is the total opening of the fracture at a certain point. It doesn't really matter to us too much how much it's open at the top and how much at the bottom, just the overall width of the opening is enough for us. So if you want here in these models, we can just compute this aperture from the yeah, individual displacements, sum this up, and then actually also change our solvers accordingly, that they exchange displacements or, yeah, or the uh, aperture, depending on what is easier or more convenient. We will also see in a second, maybe that this, well, we should see in a second, that this can have benefits to you, you go with one way or the other. Now, like an interesting point that comes up here is the data communication and data mapping, actually. So since we have this mixed dimensional problem, uh, yeah, in the lower dimensional case, like 2D, 1D case, it would look a bit like the way it is here on the slide. So we have a line mesh, like a one-dimensional mesh for the flow solver, so the fracture flow solver, where we compute the pressure. These are these dark brown, dark orange nodes. And then we have a top mesh of the fracture and the bottom mesh. At the top mesh, we have the displacement at the top, which is U plus, and at the bottom, we have the displacement at the bottom, which is then U minus at this individual point. Now there we have to communicate data in a, we have from the flow mesh to the top and the bottom mesh and the other way around. And one thing I also wanted to point out, just in case you're curious, there are special notes at the beginning and the end, the fracture tips. So we have fractures that do not evolve, so they don't grow over time in the sense in their spatial location. They open and or close, but they don't get more wide or things like that. So there, these nodes we can fix, so we don't have to yeah, worry about them, so to say. And now for the actual communication, I will also just say, boil it down a bit more. I will just take some excerpt of some points, uh, because it's like the same then for all the points after all. And so again, we have the porous medium top and bottom and our flow mesh in the, in the center. And now for data communication from the flow solver to the porous medium solver, uh, yeah, we have to communicate the pressure. The pressure should come from the flow to the porous medium. And the thing is that we technically only have one mesh in the center and it wants to communicate the pressure to the top and the bottom mesh. And like when we started with this work, uh, yeah, now quite some time ago, about two years ago, maybe even a bit longer, um, yeah, this was not really possible in precise yet, at least not just with three meshes, because we we're having multiple mappings from one mesh, or yeah, two several other meshes, uh, it's like a problem or can be a problem. But we, yeah, say we were lucky, or uh, I'm very happy that the precise developers were so nice to us to actually uh, look a bit into that, and they uh, yeah, worked on it in like a merge request on GitHub that allows for yeah, more mappings from one and two mesh. And this way, we can nicely yeah, realize this kind of mapping that the pressure is mapped via precise from the nodes of the flow mesh to the produce medium mesh. 
we could just also work, or we also worked around that in the beginning by defining the center mesh twice, which is fine, but uh, this way it's much cleaner and you also have less data to communicate, which is a good yeah, thing from our experience. Now what gets a bit more interesting or also more tricky is this communication from the porous medium to the free flow. Now uh, thanks to these changes with this multiple mappings, we can map the displacement from the top and the displacement from the bottom to the flow mesh. And then on this flow mesh we compute our actual aperture which we want to use, which we need in the yeah, flow model. So that's good. Uh, it's also very nice that it's rather simple to implement and it also immediately works in parallel when you implement it like that, or at least it was that case for us when we did it with our solvers. Now we did some simulations and we saw for some cases it's actually better to not communicate the this, yeah, displacement individually, but to actually sum up already the displacements to get the aperture and then communicate the aperture to the flow solver. So in the sense this bottom mesh that we kind of slightly gray out or it's more pale because these nodes you don't really new, need or use to communicate uh, the aperture but internally of the forest medium solver we add up the displacements to get, to get the aperture and this is then given over to the flow solver. There was a bit of extra code in the produce medium server to do this addition, but it was nice. We sign yeah, a bit of stability for some of our simulations. And also, again, yeah, less information that has to be communicated. Instead of displacement from top and bottom individually, we only need to communicate half the amount of data since it's just the displacement, not the displacement, but just the aperture that has to be communicated. So that was great. But then we went for some larger meshes, so we also wanted to run the simulations in parallel again. And then, yeah, you run into a bit into the probably obvious problem that you might not have all information where you need it. So you have sketched it here, a uh, simple case with three ranks. So we have uh, rank zero at the top left, at rank to, uh, one at top right. They are both own parts of the top mesh and the rank three at the bottom. And now we cannot locally pre-compute the aperture anymore because rank zero doesn't have information about the displacement at the bottom. And yeah, it's a bit tricky. You can then start communicating that yourself, but it's just, just tedious. You have to change your solvers a lot all of a sudden. And I mean, this is also one of the benefits of this black box approach with pre that you don't have to do too much with your solver and then just can of new coupled problems, those are something we didn't really want to do. And so we also thought that maybe we don't have to do this ourselves, because in some sense Precise knows about these things normally. If I just communicate data to Precise on the, onto the yeah, coupling meshes and then request it to be mapped, maybe Precise can do that. And we are lucky, or we were lucky, that Precise actually can do this now with this change which allows several mappings from and to meshes. I don't want to say that it works for every case. There's like edge, or edge cases. In some sense, I think the edge cases work. There's a lot of cases where these mappings are not necessarily well defined. But in our case here, we were lucky the way we worked with that and how we defined that. So we can say again, we can kind of go back one step and say, okay, each of the meshes of the porous media meshes actually um, <clears throat> communicates just the yeah, displacement or the normal displacement on its surface, gives it to precise, and yeah, because we kind of want to send it to the flow mesh, but before it's handed over to the flow mesh, precise internally will use the addition of the two displacements so that we get the aperture, aperture out of that. And if you do this correctly, we can also run the post-processing or the acceleration schemes actually on the aperture instead of the displacements. Um, this again gave us or brought us into the session with improved coupling stability and coupling convergence, which is very nice. It also made the simulations in partially faster because yeah, again, we have less unknowns to incorporate. And so uh, communication is a bit faster, but also the acceleration can get faster if it runs on the, uh, on the aperture instead of the displacement. 
So we were very happy with that, that this worked out in the end. And that it out worked out this way. Um, so with that, I want to show you some uh, so, yeah, solutions or first something about the implementation. Yeah, we've implemented the solvers with uh, Phoenix and Precise. Phoenix is like an open source library, especially for finite element discretizations. And we also here use standard finite element methods for the porous medium and the fracture flow solver. And yeah, we have all this data communication. Uh, basically, uh, as you can see, pressure from the fracture flow solver via precise to produce medium and the other way around, basically what I've shown you before. And what is also very nice now, since we have these parallel execution capabilities in precise, and we also have this in Phoenix, we could immediately run our solvers in parallel. We didn't go, say, too crazy yet, but we've tested it just for problems with up to 10 million unknowns so far and 256 cores. And that worked uh, without any further adjustment or any, yeah, any other yeah, problems, let's say. Also, just here's a note, these are the papers uh, that describe the mathematical model with this mixed dimension or mixed dimensional approach that you have there. Now to the actual results. First, we wanted to make sure that our coupling actually recovers the real physical behavior. And for the simple test problem we saw in the beginning with this cube where there's like a disc or yeah, ring shaped or disc with a hole shaped fracture, we were lucky because uh, yeah, co-author Patrick Schmidt had like also a monolithic solver for that. And uh, so we could compute once the monolithic solution and then the staggered or partition solution. And you see in the top right then the pressure over the fracture length and you see the solutions are really good they have been very good agreement i don't think you see much of a difference especially if you watched this video now uh, so if you don't just trans, don't just tr uh, trust your eyes but we also compute uh, an error where we assume the staggered or, or solution be uh, the new approximation and the monolithic solution being the exact solution or the the truth and we see that the errors is we are at most about two percent and also gets, gets better over several time steps that the simulation goes over. So we are very happy with that. Our simulation works, it runs in parallel, and it also gives reasonable results. So that's very good. Then one thing, uh, since it was like also a new application for us, was we wanted to see how is actually this coupling behavior, which are suitable interface quasi-Newton methods, and which are the kind of good parameters to put in or to plug in. So we yeah, went for a rather extensive parameter study for serial and uh, parallel implicit. Here are the results for the serial implicit coupling. You find also the parallel implicit coupling results in the paper if you are uh, interested. And there we compare the yeah, inverse least squares and the inverse multi-vector Jacobian methods. And the first thing that we see, it works, so that's very good. And you also see in the heat maps there, uh, the number of coupling iterations per time step or the average number of coupling iterations per time step. And you can see that there are potentially bigger differences depending on the parameters. Especially for the ILS scheme, you see for very low reuse or no reuse, you get rather worse results as expected. And there's also some more dependency on this filter, so it should not be too, yeah, don't, don't use a too large filter limit. But otherwise, you end up in a coupling about four and a half iterations per time step. For the multi vector methods, you see it's in some sense, less dependent on the parameter, which is good and also we are expected due to the way the method is or works. And yeah, you get down to around four, four-ish coupling iterations per time step. So uh, it's a bit easier to get lower coupling iterations. So in this sense, it's basically what we expect normally also from literature. So we're happy with the results first that we don't see anything surprising and that we could see if we use a yeah, moderate numbers for the filter limits and also the reuse parameters or yeah, single value decomposition thresholds, we get good results. So we feel like we know what to do to tackle more complicated problems. One thing I want to mention here, because it's not really obvious from the heat maps, is that the very first time step is basically what is very hard. And the first time step, we have the biggest deformation, so with the biggest relative changes. And at the same time, these quasi-Newton methods don't have information from previous time steps or from the past. So there, I kind of 
behaving or worst but while we have strong changes changes so there is like always a big problem or a big problem is like a big challenge for the coupling there's also where most of the time is spent you normally see that's like a graph in with a lot of coupling iterations at the beginning and then it goes down slowly uh of, sorry it goes down rather quickly after the first one two time steps so there's the first time step is really something one has to keep an eye on now with <clears throat> uh, having our validated our implementation and understanding a bit the coupling behavior depending on the coupling or acceleration methods we went for more complex problems so we extended that actually for fracture networks here's just like an example where you see we get a pressure injection on the left and a, well, a fluid injection basically on the left so we have high pressure here and on the right uh, we extract fluid so there the pressure is lower and so you see also from the left to right that the pressure decreases which is nice which is basically what we expect um, I have also like a small video here at the top you have the pressure again at the bottom the aperture and you see the fracture at the right even closes a bit because of the lower pressure that's basically what we want to see what we expect i will just play this video once again so you can see at the top how the pressure is de developing over time and at the bottom how the deformation is changing but basically you see more things happening at the very first time steps and then it's only very few or very little changes afterwards yes now from this pressure field we can also reconstruct the actual flow field and yeah you see there's flow coming or starting where we inject fluid and it goes to the point where we extract the fluid again which is great you see also kind of main flow pass via these fractures here at the bottom and uh, some fracture flow going at the top and what is also very good you see this fracture which is kind of disconnected it, it's connected but it's not really in the flow pass also these fractures here at the top right there's no flow in there and this is good because we don't expect flow there there's no way the fluid can go anywhere so uh, via this fracture so there should be no fluid flow in there which means we get reasonable physical behavior here and this also brings me to the end of the presentation so we have used the black box coupling methods from precise for hydromechanical or hydromechanical coupled problems so it's very nice we avoid all these problems with monolithic uh, solvers also this implementation was actually much easier than it was for the monolithic solver like when i talked to patrick he was very happy with this approach using precise because it was really a pain for him to implement the monolithic solver earlier we also see that we still get very get good agreement with the monolithic solver so we approximate the correct physical behavior and we could also extend it even for uh, two fracture networks which are actually much more complicated and we could also run everything in parallel which is very nice in order to tackle bigger problems in the future now like there's like some open problems or things we would like to improve like especially one thing is the yeah, robustness for the first time step uh, yeah, which is a bit tricky because you don't have information from previous steps but maybe one can come up with something smart there say surrogate models machine learning something like that but yeah we haven't looked into that yet into too detailed at least for the simulation at the moment it also works so we are happy with it it's also been still nice to also look a bit into this parallel efficiency which be yeah, kind of part if you want to go for large scale or bigger problems and one thing i haven't really pointed out too much but we would like to look a bit more into how to handle the fracture networks properly at the moment you saw it works but this was an implementation that only works yeah on one rank so we cannot have parallel execution which would be very nice for the fracture networks because it's also usually more time consuming uh, simulations so there's something that we have to fix in the yeah fracture networks but they're also a bit more tricky because we have more points that have yeah, need special behavior and so on and it's not always clear or easy how to define some side as top and bottom side of a fracture yeah and this now brings it to the end Thank you very much for listening to my talk and uh, yeah, I hope you enjoy it. If you have questions, please don't hesitate to contact me either now during the workshop or after the workshop. So see you.